emploi, aux conditions de travail au sein de l'Organisation mondiale de la propriété intellectuelle, l'OMPI, également au sein du système euh, des, des Nations Unies, une thématique donc euh, très large qui euh, met en, disons soyons clairs, qui euh, pose la, vraiment la question de la légalité, légitimité du fonctionnement en matière de droit des, des employés dans le système onusien. Nous avons euh, contacté euh, l'OMPI, juste pour le clarifier cela, nous avons contacté l'OMPI afin de leur donner aussi la possibilité évidemment de s'exprimer sur cette question de, et de euh, présenter leur, leurs arguments. Euh, je ne sais pas si cette invitation sera, euh, a été, euh, elle a en tout cas été reçue, mais n'a pas euh, forcément été euh, eu de suite. Voilà, je crois qu'on va directement passer à, à la conférence de presse et je vais passer la parole à Madame Nadia Raimi, qui est une ancienne conseillère à l'OMPI. Madame Raimi, c'est à vous, la parole est à vous. Messieurs, Monsieur Rocher, merci beaucoup et bonne année à tout le monde. Good afternoon, a very warm welcome to the round table today organized by the UN New World Syndicat. We are here today, we are here today to bring to your kind attention the atrocity, lawless, lawless, uh, lawlessness, all forms of harassment, abuse of power, retaliation, and illegal dismissals, uh, the staff of the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, were and are subjected to in the hands of the WIPO administration and direct involvement of its Director General, Francis Gori. The panelists also will appeal at the end for fundamental changes in this regard at the WIPO in particular and in the whole UN system in general. In order to save time, I just wanted to, to introduce the panelists and give full time for an authority for them to brief you and also time for the question and answer to hear from you. Before introducing the panelists, I would like to inform you that unfortunately, Our president, president of the UN New World Syndicate, Mr. Jack Venn, who really tirelessly tried to convene this event, is not well. He had some health issues, and he will be represented by the Secretary General of the New World Syndicate, Mr. Kalman Kalote. And then we will follow uh, the debate Uh, with another panelist, uh, Mr. Willy, uh, former uh, WIPO <laughs> um, chief executive and former vice president of the staff association of, of WIPO. And then we go to our lawyer, a famous lawyer in the whole UN system who defended half of our colleagues from different organizations Mr. Uh, Edward Flaherty. So I would give, give the floor to Mr. Calote to uh, in, introduce himself as well as to start with his presentation. Thank you. Okay. Merci, cher Najmia. Uh, Permettez-moi de parler français de toute façon. C'est une conférence de presse bilingue. Uh, vous avez la liberté totale de nous poser des questions en français, anglais, bon, peut-être un peu aussi en espagnol. Et on arrête avec ça. Et tout d'abord, un cordial bienvenue de la part du syndicat Nouveau des Nations Unies à, à vous. Et, et merci de votre présence à, à cet événement si important pour les droits syndicaux, qui sont aussi des droits humains. Il ne faut pas oublier. 
Mon nom est Kalman Kalotai, je suis secrétaire général euh, du syndicat Newwood. Euh, comme euh, elle a déjà mentionné, je remplace euh, aujourd'hui notre président, M. Vigne, qui est malheureusement tombé malade, et pour qui les médecins ont interdit de sortir de son lit. Donc il va nous suivre sur YouTube ou sur Facebook, c'est à son choix. Euh, néanmoins, vous pourrez entendre sa voix par le biais d'un film court enregistré en 2008, ici sur l'écran. Il va expliquer, expliquer pourquoi le syndicat s'appelle New Wood et euh, ses buts en ce qui concerne euh, l'application des droits du de travail dans l'ensemble de la famille onusienne, c'est-à-dire le, le secrétariat des Nations Unies plus la totalité des agents spécialisés. Euh, juste avant de montrer ce film, euh, permettez-moi de vous souligner que nous sommes un syndicat onusien et suisse en même temps. Euh, en effet, nous sommes membres de plein droit de la communauté genevoise d'action syndicale et de l'Union syndicale suisse, ce qui est unique parmi les syndicats internationaux à Genève. Autrement dit, nous sommes un pont entre ces deux mondes. Avec ça, maintenant, je, je donne la parole à M. Jacques Vigne, dans son absence, est-ce qu'on peut montrer le film au milieu de ma présentation Merci. Chers camarades, je vais ajouter quelques mots à ce que vient de dire Jean-Claude Prince. Bon, j'interviens euh, en tant que vice-président du syndicat New des Nations Unies. Je rappellerai qu'en 1998, quand nous avons créé le syndicat, nous avons créé ce syndicat justement comme, avec comme objectif essentiel la mise en œuvre des droits du travail dans les organisations internationales. Et pourquoi nous l'avons appelé New World ben Tout simplement parce qu'on nous disait toujours que les fonctionnaires, l'administration nous disait que les fonctionnaires c'était du vieux bois, du bois mort. Alors nous avons voulu montrer par cette appellation de New Wood ou de bois neuf qu'il y a encore du bois neuf dans l'organisation. Et c'était la raison pour laquelle nous l'avons appelé comme ça. Je rappellerai que cette année, c'est le 60e anniversaire de la non-application, je dis bien de la non-application, d'une résolution adoptée par l'Assemblée Générale des Nations Unies en 1948 qui reprenait l'ensemble des principes adoptés à la Conférence Internationale du Travail dans la Déclaration de Philadelphie. Donc cette année, c'est le 60e anniversaire de la non-application des droits du travail dans l'Organisation des Nations Unies. Il faut quand même se rappeler de ça, parce que ça fait 60 ans que l'organisation ne respecte pas une de ces résolutions essentielles qui est justement la mise en œuvre des droits du travail dans l'organisation des Nations Unies pour tous les fonctionnaires. Et comme je dis souvent, et en me référant même à ce qu'a dit le secrétaire général, l'ancien secrétaire général Kofi Annan à Davos en 2003, il avait déclaré que les principes adoptés en 1998 sont applicables à tous les êtres humains et à toutes les sociétés sur la Terre. Or, jusqu'à preuve du contraire, les fonctionnaires sont aussi des êtres humains. Or, c'est clair, il faut dire que certains nous ont dit, comme par exemple à l'époque euh, le secrétaire général de, de Force Ouvrière, euh, Marc Londel, il nous avait dit en 98 justement, c'est exactement comme si vous étiez des extraterrestres. C'est exactement comme si vous étiez des habitants de la planète Mars. Parce que finalement, vous n'avez pas les droits qui sont les droits de tous les êtres humains. Et ça, c'est absolument inadmissible. Donc, je voulais rajouter ça. Je voulais rajouter qu'en cette année, justement, de la première célébration de la Journée mondiale du travail décent, les organisations internationales du système des Nations Unies restent encore, je dois le dire, malheureusement, un lieu de travail qui n'est pas décent, tout simplement parce que, justement, les principes du travail décent ne sont pas respectés dans ces organisations du système des Nations Unies, à commencer par l'Organisation internationale du travail, 
qui ne respecte pas ses propres principes pour ses fonctionnaires. Voilà, merci beaucoup, chers camarades, de votre attention. Donc, merci, j'adore ce film amateur avec tous ses défauts. Ça démontre quel est le message très principal. Bon. Et juste une remarque, qu il a parlé de 60 heures en de non-application de cette résolution 1948, oui, euh, numéro 127, c'est ça Oui, nous avons laissé quelques copies sur la table de, de, de l'entrée. Donc logiquement, cette année-là, on va fêter quoi 72 ans de non-application de, de, de la même résolution. Mais... mais Maintenant, ici, nous sommes surtout pour parler du cas de l'OMPI, l'une des agences spécialisées, et, et sa situation en ce qui concerne les droits de travail dans cette organisation. Et je vais laisser sur, surtout M. Lee et Flaherty à vous fournir plus de détails sur cette organisation et la situation euh, spécifique. Néanmoins, en ce qui concerne... Euh, euh, la situation des droits euh, du travail, on, il reste à constater un manque de progrès total en ce qui concerne leur application dans l'ensemble de la famille onusienne, peut-être avec quelques exceptions de l'OIT. Donc, si le représentant de l'OIT veut nous, veut nous fournir plus de détails, on peut discuter pourquoi. Je pense qu'il y a quelques demi-progrès en ce qui concerne cette organisation spécifique qui est bien moins censée de promouvoir les droits du travail. Donc, il y a quelques logiques derrière euh, cette situation. Euh, dans les autres organisations, depuis 2008, rien n'a bougé. Je pense que bien au contraire, nous avons beaucoup de moins de droits de travail, de travail euh, euh, en ce qui concerne, euh, euh, en comparaison avec les euh, travailleurs suisses. Euh, même si je compare euh, les fonctionnaires internationaux avec euh, les travailleurs suisses dans une situation pré précaire. Parce que ce qui a changé à l'ONU, c'est la précarité croissante de nos employés. Et si vous voulez, on peut aussi ouvrir une discussion quels sont les changements en ce qui concerne euh, les contrats des fonctionnaires ou la facilité de, de renvoyer les fonctionnaires des Nations Unies ou des agences spécialisées. Bon, de retour au cas de l'OMPI, j'aimerais souligner encore un autre problème du système onusien en ce qui concerne l'administration de justice. Euh, je suis sûr que vous êtes au courant que ces organisa organisations jouissent grâce à leur accord de siège de l'immunité juridique. Et par conséquent, si un fonctionnaire se sent lésé dans son travail, il doit faire recours à la justice interne, soit le tribunal de contentieux administratif des Nations Unies de première instance, et le tribunal d'appel des Nations Unies deuxième instance, c'est le cas pour le secrétariat, ou le tribunal administratif de l'OIT, qui a une, une qui n'a qu'une seule instance pour les, pour les agences spécialisées. Donc c'est ça le, la situation de justice pour les fonctionnaires des, de Nations Unies et de la femme, famille onusienne. Or, ce système n'est pas complet parce qu'elle manque de moyens, tout d'abord pour la mise en application des, dé, des décisions, c'est-à-dire l'exécution des jugements reste à bon vouloir de la directrice générale ou, ou le, le chef, les chefs des agences spécialisées. Nous avons en parlé un peu. Et en plus, ces tribunaux n'ont aucun mandat ou moyen euh, à condamner les fautifs. Seulement euh, donner euh, quelques compensations pécuniaires euh, aux victimes. Les fautifs peuvent encourir au maximum des sanctions administratives. Naturellement, les accords de siège prévoient la possibilité de coopération entre le monde onusien et la Suisse en ce qui concerne la bonne administration de justice. Si je ne me trompe pas, c'est quelque chose comme euh, euh, paragraphe 8 de, de l'accord de siège de l'OMPI. Il y a aussi un paragraphe pareil dans l'accord de siège des Nations Unies. Mais cette coopération est toujours volontaire et dépend cas par cas de la levée de l'immunité des personnes concernées. Je suis sûr que M. Lee et Flaherty, tant qu'experts juristes, ont quelque chose à vous dire à ce sujet. 
Mais en ce moment, je vais laisser le reste du temps au cas de l'OMPI et je suis naturellement à votre disposition pour répondre à vos questions. Merci de votre attention. Thank you, Mr. Colota. Um, now I will call upon Mr. Willy to start his uh, um, uh, whatever he has to share with you, and he will talk to you uh, about two major uh, issues that he wanted to, to, to discuss or share with you. But every time he will in we will invite. Uh, Mr. Flaherty to somehow compliment or give you more elaboration in that regard. So they will do it together, uh, the first and second part, and then we will go to the third and fourth part of this presentation. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I don't even pretend to speak the French. <laughs> Before, the, before I start the presentation, I will just quickly introduce myself. Um, first of all, thanks very much for coming. And we owe our debt to uh, Mr. Matang uh, and Mr. Rishi for offering such a prestige facility. Thank you very much. And also, thanks very much to Mr. Kalate and Mr. Wang and Ms. Mr. Ben and Mr. Uh, and Mr. Uh, Rahim, thank you very much. Without them, these, without their tireless effort, this event will never happen. Uh, myself, my, my name is Wei Lei. I, I was the Chief Information Officer of World Intellectual Property Organization, or WIPO in short, uh, as one of the most senior officials of the organization. I was also the vice president of uh, WIPO's staff association. Uh, the reason brought me here was largely because I was also a whistleblower. <laughs> I provided critical information to the United Nations Office of Internal Oversight Service uh, in an investigation against uh, WIPO Director General Mr. Gary's inappropriate influence over a procurement. Mm -hmm. The information I provided led to OIOS conclude uh, uh, the Director General's behavior uh, breached staff rules and regulations, and they recommended the WIPO uh, member states to take actions against him. He was nevertheless given uh, a second chance. He was also warned uh, not to go after the whistleblowers. Uh, now I'm here, so you know what happened. <laughs> but we're not here, uh, Ms. Uh, Rahimi and myself, we're not here to vent our personal uh, uh, any uh, dissatisfaction or whatever things he, uh, he, you, might, you, might, you might think. We are here to indeed to expose the serious issues in WIPO, and in many ways these issues uh, have uh, UN-wide implications. Um, now let me get on to my presentation. I think I might be better off to operate from there unless I have some remote control because of the slide. I'm here today to talk about the WIPO. If 
the United Nations is a crown. In many ways, WIPO could be considered as one of the brightest jewels on the crown. But very unfortunate. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Is it better? I'll just talk louder. <laughs> but very unfortunate. Uh, this this um, jewel has been seriously tainted, especially during the recent years. I use this title, I borrowed this title, Total Wipeout. These are not my words. I need to give credit to this particular journalist on the bottom of the screen. His name is uh, John Oates. He wrote an article about me and Waipu. Uh, that's the title uh, of the article, the Waipu without E. <laughs> Waipu was referred, Waipu earned the title in, a, in some way um, as the FIFA of the United Nations. Whether that's a, that's a praise uh, for WIPO's superior organizational skill and marketing skill for spotting international sporting event or something else, I'll let you draw your own conclusions. By the end of the, this presentation, I hope you will have a different idea. And my email is also there. If you want to have follow-up information or ask other questions, you can ask me at the end of presentation or send me the email at the end. Now let me get on to these, if I can find the right buttons. Who is it? Oh, it's here on the bottom. That's wrong, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, it worked. My presentation is divided into four parts. First one, I will talk about the background of the ILO judgment 4155. And then I will talk about the general observa uh, observations of the situation in WIPO. The third part, I will talk about why such scenarios, why such practices uh, could thrive in WIPO. The last part, I will talk about going forward from here. What should we do? Mm. <coughs> now, WIPO Staff Association has served WIPO staff for 60 years. Its coverage of, it covers about 50% 50, uh, 50 of WIPO staff. And it's also the only staff representation entity recognized by the Inter uh, International Staff Federations. Faced with ongoing criticisms from the staff association, especially some of the staff association's uh, whistleblowers, the organization decided in 2017 uh, not to recognize WIPO staff association anymore. You can read the screen as, as good as I do, so I don't intend to go through each one by one. Uh, but I just want to highlight the very last point because I will touch on the point in particular later on. Uh, the WIPO staff, staff Association's communications to staff uh, is subject to the administration's approval. And with all those said, WIPO also initiated, orchestrated, uh, election of the new staff representation. What I'd like to emphasize on the new staff representation is the new entity organized and orchestrated by the administration doesn't have a single member. 
Mm. It has no member. So you might ask, how does it survive? Mm. Well, normally, unions or other staff representations, you have your own uh, uh, member membership contributions. That's the primary income, uh, not just to operate, but also to show your independence. But that entity is 100% living on the administration's budget. So again, I'll let you draw your own conclusion whether that, can, that could possibly be independent or not. With all these happen in the background, of course, Weibo Staff Association decided to appeal, mm. to file a complaint. And now I, I would like to ask Mr. Flaherty to say a few things about the particular judgment. So once the whole thing goes through, uh, went through the whole process and reached the ILO tribunal, so what was the tribunal's, what was in that judgment, 40, uh, 4155, and what happened now? Please. Thank you, Wei, and, and uh, thank you to everyone for coming uh, and, and to the club press for uh, having us here today and for the organizers as well and my colleagues on the panel. Um, as uh, Najmi uh, mentioned, I'm a lawyer who mostly represents international civil servants uh, who work for UN and uh, other international organizations, not necessarily just the UN organizations, it's specialized agencies as well. Uh, and I've been doing that uh, for 25 years. I've been a lawyer for 35 years, but I've, uh, I've been doing this work uh, this month, 25 years. So, um, And one of the main administrative tribunals to which uh, staff members of international organizations have access to to vindicate their rights is the International Labor Office Administrative Tribunal. And just if I may, just very briefly di uh, um, digress a bit, just to give you some background. The International Labor Office Administrative Tribunal is the successor to the League of Nations Administrative Tribunal, which was set up in 1919. And the specific purpose of the League of Nations Administrative Tribunal was to ensure the security and independence of international civil servants who worked for the League of Nations at that time, not to protect the administrations, not to protect the senior management of the administrations, but to protect the rank and file of those organizations. Now, of course, um, the uh, League of Nations went out of business, and then with, with the creation of the United Nations in, in 1945, and one of the first organizations that was created with it, one of the first specialized agencies, was the International Labor Office. The International Labor Office revived the League of Nations Administrative Tribunal, and it became the ILO Administrative Tribunal. Uh, and it's been operating since 1945, uh, it has more uh, uh, now more than 4,000 report, almost 5,000 reported judgments, uh, which can be found, uh, including the case I'm going to speak about very briefly in a minute, which is the case 4155. It can all the judgments can be found at uh, www.ilo.org/trib. And again, I, I urge you to go and, and read the judgment itself. It's very short. It's only about eight pages, which was quite surprising. Um, this, this judgment itself was also surprising to me because despite the, the background, the history of the ILO being uh, the, the successor to the League of Nations Administrative Tribunal, in recent times, it is no longer there to protect the, in my opinion, uh, the independence and s security of international civil servants. It is there to protect the management, the senior officials. Uh, and, and it's borne out by the fact that statistically, staff members who ultimately appeal to the ILO Administrative Tribunal win less than 30% of the time, win less than, win less than 30% of the time anything. Not just, I mean, I don't think there's any case where a staff member has won everything they've asked for from the ILOAT. I could be wrong, but uh, I'm not aware of that case. Um, but generally, uh, staff win something less than 30% of the time. So, I mean, that's already a, uh, quite a, indicates quite a bias. For, to give you a, a comparison, although it's not quite apples and oranges, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, after a case has gone past the issue of admissibility or receivability, making sure you, f you went through all the hoops to get yourself before the European Court of Human Rights. In those cases, 
complainants win 60% of the time. Uh, so there's quite a difference. Now, many more cases before the European Court of Human Rights get knocked out on receivability, admissibility issues, but that's, that's a different story. Um, the other issue uh, which Mr. Uh, Kalate has uh, touched on is the issue of international conventions and human rights uh, agreements. Um, the, the ILOET in several judgments has uh, affirmed we, the, it's, it abides by those principles, but in practice it's very difficult to find any judgment where they've been applied in, in practice. So, um, you know, again, the, the background, the, the, the history is all lovely, but the, in the application uh, it's not very pretty. And, and unfortunately, there seems to be a trend since night, uh, 2014 um, to, that staff are winning less and that the amount of judgments are even less. So uh, that presents a big problem, and, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit later when we, we talk about generally some of the other issues at, at, at WIPO. But um, with this particular case, as, as Wei had mentioned, the Staff Association for, for 60, at that point it was 56 years, uh, staff, members of the paid members of the Staff Association elected members to the WIPO Staff Council, which under Regulation 8.1 uh, of the WIPO's staff regulations uh, was the sole interlocutor with the Director General, with the administration, for um, uh, staff issues. So that went on for 56 years. And in fact, in a case in 2006, uh, several uh, staff members tried to establish their own, a, a new staff association. And WIPO at that point, uh, if I'm, in my opinion, the, the staff association at that time was quite, uh, again, closely aligned with the administration. So they didn't want that, and they fought the, the attempt to establish a new staff association. It went all the way to the ILOAT. I represented the, the new staff association. Uh, we lost at the ILOAT because the ILOAT at that point, with the agreement of the WIPO administration agreed that Regulation 8.1 provided for one staff council and one staff association, and that only paid members of the staff association could elect members of the staff council. Fast forward to 2014, um, after uh, one of the uh, presidents of the WIPO staff council had been fired uh, by the administration, uh, Mr. Gar uh, the, I should say the Director General of WIPO um, sent out a message encouraging staff to complain about the fact that only uh, mem paid members of the staff association at WIPO could vote for the staff council. And of course, suddenly there was a petition, uh, and on the basis of the petition that was instigated by, by the administration, the, WIPO decided we're going to reinterpret uh, Regulation 8.1, which had, uh, again, had been interpreted the same way and accepted for 56 years by successive WIPO administrations, which was there's one staff association and only paid members of the staff association um, can, can vote for the election of the staff council members who are the interlocutor with the, with the administration. Now, the, 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 the charter of the WIPO Staff Association says that it represents all staff members, whether they are paid or not. But in terms of voting, it, you have to be a paid staff member. As Wei spoke uh, about previously, that's the only way they could be independent, is if they had paid staff members who supported them and they weren't on the trough of the administration. So this, uh, as a result of this change in the interpretation of Regulation 8.1, the administration stepped in organized new staff elections, um, in, in my opinion, and this is an, a, a matter that's still pending on appeal, interfered with the, with the elections. Um, and of course, very few of the uh, original staff council members were elected <laughs> in the new elections. The then members of the staff council who had, uh, had been pushed out illegally, which in, in I, my view was a, was a gross interference with the right of every single WIPO staff member's right to association. The ILOAT has been very clear in its jurisprudence that the, staff, the, the administration of an international organization cannot in any way interfere in 
how a staff association organizes itself, runs its elections, interacts with the administration. But what WIPO did in 2014 was a blatant violation of that principle of the right of association. The staff members appealed. Um, part of the problem with this system that ultimately ends up at the ILOET is that you have to go through the eternal board of appeal in international organizations before you make it to the ILOAT. It took some almost two years before the WIPO uh, Joint Appeals Board made a recommendation back to the Director General. Um, they did award the, the appellants 500 uh, francs each for the delay in the appeal, but they dismissed all the charges and they simply agreed with, with uh, the, the Director General, which is not unusual because the the composition of the Joint Appeals Board is the, um, the the Director General has three votes and the staff members have two. So of course there was uh, it was unlikely that the staff would would prevail. They then appealed to the ILOAT and, uh, and again one of the problems of, with the ILOAT system is the delay. It takes uh, at this time it was taking more than two years for a case to be finished from the, from the time it was filed with the ILOET till the time the judgment was announced was more than two years, often two and a half years. It's gotten a little bit better now, it's about 18 months, but it's still, that's not great. Um, so this, this judgment 4155 was announced in, um, uh, in July of, of last year. And, and it, it, as I said, it was very short. And I'll just, I'll just, um, I mean they recounted the, many of the details, um, but if I can just read the sort of the penultimate paragraph, and it says, the circumstances prevailing immediately before November 2014 were that the body described in Staff Regulation 8.1 was constituted by members of the Staff Association who had been elected to the Association Staff Council under the rules of the Association. This involved, at least implicitly, an acceptance by the WIPO administration that Staff Regulation 8.1 permitted or authorized the constitution of the Staff Council in this way. What, in effect, WIPO had done was to adopt and assert an interpretation of Staff Regulation 8.1, which is partisan in the sense that it is an interpretation which was obviously aimed at disadvantaging the Staff Association and its members, having regard to the long-standing practice, 56 years, concerning the constitution of the Staff Council, and favoring the administration in the sense that it does not have to deal with individuals as members of the Staff Council with necessarily what it, it almost certainly uh, is almost certainly significant authority deriving from the membership of the staff association in their election by that membership. This constituted an abuse of power. I was frankly quite surprised by that, given the trend of the ILOAT away from protecting the rights of, of individual staff. Um, but I guess this was, this was a bridge too far, even for the ILOAT, and they very, very clearly uh, uh, called this a, a, a gross abuse. Uh, I'll, I'll call it gross. It was an abuse of power uh, and, a, and, a, and a direct interference with the right of association of individual staff members. As I said, it's, it's, it's only, well, I think, yeah, eight pages. You can find it on the, on the website of the ILRT, and I, I urge you to, to, to take a look at it. It's Judgment 4155. I'll, with that, I'll... Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Uh, Flaherty. Would you also like to talk about uh, whether WIPO administration has accepted? Sure. Yes. Then, so this this judgment was announced in um, uh, July of, of 2019. It, uh, I think July 3rd. On July 8th, the Director General issued a uh, all staff email. Um, essentially uh, saying that WIPO would ignore the judgment. It's saying it didn't apply to them because uh, the, the interpretation of Staff Regulation 8.1, which is what the ILOAT had said had been partisan and an abuse of power, had been codified subsequently in the staff rules, and therefore there was no case to answer and he was not going to do anything. Of course, simply by codifying their... Um, a regular interpretation of staff regulation 8.1 into the staff rules, and it's almost word for word, it's just the same thing. Um, it, they, they've committed the same wrong that, that uh, the tribunal pointed out in Judgment 4155. Uh, but 
such as it is. So um, now that was back in, in, Ju in July of 2019. Um, there are two different um, avenues of, of redress being pursued uh, against that decision, and they're still pending. But of course, the the problem is is that they have to, one has to go through the White Bill Appeals Board, which will take, which is controlled by the administration, so it may take another two years or a year and a half, and then back to the ILOAT, which will be another could be another 18 months. Although, um, uh, in this particular action, a, a request for execution of the prior judgment, it may be it may be quicker. But um, so we'll see. But it's unfortunately it's it's not going to happen anytime soon. It's, it's the administration has simply ignored it, saying it doesn't apply to us. Pound sand. Thank you again. Uh, now let me move on to the second part of my presentation to talk about the uh, general observations of the suppression of labor and human rights in the organization. Uh, we have covered uh, specifically about the background of Judgment 4155 and mm, the outcome of that. Now let me move on to the specific, uh, more general issues. To some extent, we have already covered the suppression of freedom of association and speech. Uh, the particular point I emphasized before, by post staff association's communication to staff is subject to the administration's approval. And uh, you can say whether that is uh, freedom of speech at all. And I also like to highlight, uh, when it comes to freedom of association, I also like to highlight that the previous staff council president and the current staff council, not current anymore, the staff, uh, staff council president and two vice presidents, me included, have all been forcefully removed from the organization. And that is the freedom of association. A few months ago, five WIPO staff Ex staff uh, jointly uh, or individually wrote the letters to uh, WIPO governing bodies. Mm. One of the complaints almost across the, uh, across the board, a uh, very common, a common feature among all the complaints was this abuse of investigative power. Mm. The administration repeatedly used this aggressive power to target anyone they deemed desirable undesirable, of course. And in my own case, I, I'd never been investigated in my life until recently, uh, three times, by WIPO. <laughs> Including once, WIPO sent its investigators to my residence to investigate my private car um, uh, under the allegation of uh, Accident, alleged accident outside WIPO premises. What's that to do with WIPO? Not to mention that the, the, the allegation was false anyway. So eventually, they launched the third one mm, against me. And I, I was finally fired by WIPO administration for allegedly using a staff member's bank card. Uh, to withdraw 300 francs from the ATM machine inside the WIPO. Uh, and don't forget, I was the chief information officer. All those surveillance and all the connections to the network was authorized by me. So of course I knew all the, where the surveillance cameras were. Uh, so that was the investigation against me. Let me read a, a paragraph written by another colleague uh, to the uh, WIPO governing body. That's what she wrote in her letter. WIPO administration and its leadership completely fail to fulfill their obligation and responsibilities towards the staff. Its internal control is not only broken and not functioning, it's aggressively used as a weapon against anyone including a victim like me of sexual harassment, who dares to reject and report its abuses. 
So that's from another colleague who is actually present today in the, in the audience. That's how WIPO use its investigative power. Once they have investigated you, they will use the legal, administration's legal and uh, administrative resources against you. Like Mr. Ferhati already mentioned, it will take you 18 months to two years just to get through the internal process, and it will take you two, even sometimes three years to get through ILO tribunal. Mm. The organization has the resources uh, to go after you and to take as long as possible. Most of staff members could not afford either mentally, professionally, and financially to sustain that kind of battle. The administration simply, what you done? That's a tactic they repeatedly use. Let me quote, yeah, let me quote another paragraph from another colleague who also wrote to the governing body. Mm. Uh, let me s share with you this paragraph to see how the internal system actually, whether it's uh, effective or not. I witnessed firsthand how other colleagues had suffered a similar fate due to the Director General's systematic disregard of the rule of law, pressuring WIPO Appeal Board until its submission or simply refusing to accept the recommendations of WIPO Appeal Board or ILO AT. That sounds familiar. He wrote this in, I think in April, yeah, in April 2019. WIPO administration refused to implement ILO AT's uh, ILO AP judgment uh, 4155 in July, a few months later. Just another example. And the person who wrote this paragraph was one of the judges in the WIPO Appeal Board. WIPO Appeal Board was supposed to be the last line of internal defense for the staff for the internal justice, because after that it goes to the tribunal. So if you have a judge sitting on the WIPO appeal board making such observations, what kind of internal justice system we have? Mm. So organization could and have repeatedly used these kind of mechanisms against the staff. Mm. I say conflict of interest by design <laughs> It's not because I think it's right. It's because it's a fact of life in Waipu. The administration repeatedly used this kind of a tactic by delegating, uh, by, delegation, by delegation of authority, authority whenever there is a claim of conflict of interest. This outcome is not just to achieve unfair, uh, this practice is not just to achieve unfair outcome against the staff. If you think that's the only thing, you're too kind. But delegation of a delegation of authority with conflict of interest, the organization also achieve other things because more people are forced to choose sides, especially senior people. More senior people are forced to choose sides. And the reality is most people will not choose the sides with the, with the uh, staff members. And they could not refuse to participate in a game against the staff members. Also, with more people choosing the sides with the, uh, with the administration, it achieves maximum isolation against the staff members. So this is not just a matter of conflict of interest. This is such a tactic to achieve maximum effect, negative maximum effect against the staff members.
Of course, all these creates a fear among the staff members. Talking about a fear or other effect, rather than giving you, giving you my own words, I will share with you what the previous WIPO ombudsperson said about WIPO in her annual report issued 2016. On page five, current situation on WIPO ombudsperson's report issued in April 2016. That's what, let's see what she said. You can see this is my copy and paste. I didn't even type the word. Uh, the, the, because of lighting, I think you probably... Ah, oh, thank you. The general paranoia, mistrust, fear of dis, uh, discrimination. On the right-hand side, you have fear of uh, speaking, uh, speaking up, fear of making mistakes, all the way to uh, perception of lack of fairness in decision-making, perception of abuse of authority. This is written by the ombudsperson of the WIPO administration. Now, before I move on to the third part, which is about, um, um, wait a second. Yeah, before I move on to the third part, which is about the, uh, which is in my to explain in my view why these could happen. Yeah, before I move on to that part, I would like to ask Mr. Flaherty to share with us uh, in, in his view because he has repre represented many WIPO staff. Thank you. Yeah, he has represented many WIPO staff. I would like to ask him to share with us his general observations as well, please. Thank you, Wei. Um, one of the points I'd like to, to, to focus on is the issue of investigations, which Wei spoke about uh, in, in, in miscon alleged misconduct cases. Um, unfortunately, the, the investigative process uh, in international organizations, it's not just WIPO, it's true in just about every other international organization, in Geneva certainly, and in the UN, um, the, the investigation service is simply an arm of the administration, so it does the bidding of the administration. It's not neutral, even though the jurisprudence of the different administrative tribunals and the, the charters of, of uh, the investigation services are that it's supposed to be neutral, it's supposed to look for both inculpatory and exculpatory evidence. That's generally, in my opinion, in my experience, not what happens. It's simply you know, it's, here's the conclusion, okay, now let's go find the evidence to find the person guilty. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit like, uh, it is the Inquisition, um, but, you know, at least the Inquisition was somewhat independent. Um, international organizations are not. The, the in investigation services are not independent from the administration, and that's, that's a big problem. Now, recently, uh, many of you may be aware, uh, UNAIDS had a, uh, an independent expert panel that examined uh, its culture of um, harassment and sexual harassment and discrimination. And one of the issues that they focused on was this very issue, the fact that there is no independent or neutral or unbiased investigation process that the, you know, whenever there's a claim of harassment or sexual harassment or misconduct, uh, it comes through the administration to the investigation service, which is an arm of the administration. And of course, they, the investigators report to the, the executive heads. They, they're going to figure out, hmm, what's in the best interest of the administration? Should I find this person guilty or should I find them not guilty? And lo and behold, that's, you know, in my experience, that's what happens. It's, there's very little connection um, to the evidence and the outcome of, in, of investigations. And the UNAIDS uh, 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 Independent Expert Panel report highlighted this and said it must change. Unfortunately, UNAIDS hasn't changed, uh, and none of the other international organizations have changed. It's, I, I use this often in my, 
um, many of my pleadings to the to the the ILO uh, in disciplinary cases where someone has gone through has been uh, accused of uh, misconduct and they've gone through the internal process, the investigation. Of course, they're found culpable, and then the board finds agrees with the with the investigation and they go to the I, what I say to the ILO is this is akin to um, uh, Stalin's chief of secret police, Beria, who, who said to Stalin once, show me the man and I'll find you the crime. And that's how these investigation services work. Administration says, show me the man, he, oh, here's the man, and then find me the crime. And that's often what happens. And, you know, given that international organizations are immune from local laws, um, those of you who work in international organizations are probably well aware of this, but those of you who don't, um, although Mr. Colette has, did speak about this uh, a bit, most international organizations here in Geneva, in New York, in Vienna, Nairobi, are immune from all local criminal and national, criminal and civil laws. Only if the administration, and it's not up to the country, it's only up to the administration to decide if, you're, if, if a staff member is charged with a crime, uh, for the administration decides to lift their immunity. And this is, this is particularly bad in cases of either sexual harassment or theft uh, or, or sexual assault. None of these investigation services are police agencies. They do not have the um, uh, means or ability or resources to carry out a true police investigation of a crime. But instead, these cases aren't referred to, to no, national authorities generally. They're, they're, they're kept inside. The, the biased investigation service does what the administration, in my opinion, wants them to do. And then, lo and behold, the person is either exonerated or, or, or fired. Um, and, and this is true. I mean, cases of, even under Swiss law, I'm not a Swiss lawyer. I'm just an American lawyer. But I'm, I'm aware of some, some aspects of Swiss law. And harassment in the workplace, if it's severe enough, can be considered a crime. Harassment in international organizations is off the charts, but according to a study done by WHO, uh, an expert hired by WHO. The incidence of harassment, of mobbing, in international organizations is significantly higher than in the private sector. And that's partly because um, a lack of a uh, functioning uh, performance evaluation, proper performance evaluation system, the existence of permanent contracts, many different reasons. But um, it's, it's very difficult um, you know, to, for uh, people, these organizations, instead of, um, when, when there is a, 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 a claim of serious harassment or, or sexual harassment or assault, Instead of immediately referring it, lifting the immunity and immediately referring it to the national authorities, they send in the investigation service, which of course pre precludes the national authorities afterwards from actually doing anything or doing, you know, being able to bring charges in many cases because the uh, the internal investigation services have mucked up the of the case. So this is one of the great problems of WIPO and all the international organizations is is the this absolute immunity that they enjoy. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's something that, that in 1945, when international organizations were established, were fledgling organizations, it probably made sense. Today, in the 21st century, you know, 20 years into the 21st century, it doesn't make sense. Now, in, many, in some member states like the U.S., there has been a, a, a trend towards uh, cutting back a bit the immunity of international organizations, like sovereign states. I mean, sovereign states do not generally function with absolute immunity in the world today. I mean, there are limitations to it. It used to be, you know, the, you know, the king, I am the king, I am the state, the l'état c'est moi. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore with, with international, with sovereign states, and it's slowly being uh, chipped away at. Uh, with international organizations, but it, it's not happening fast enough for people today who, f who work for these organizations and who suffer as a result of biased investigations, uh, you know, uh, a biased uh, internal justice system. And, and this is what, what Wei was speaking about. This is, this is these cases are, are a symptom of a, of a broken system. And, in, and again, 
it, you know, the, uh, most of the organizations, WIPO is a specialized agency of the UN. There is no excuse that they, sh that they don't have the best system of justice, but they don't. I mean, they, ha they probably have the worst. Um, all of the, I'm, I'm speaking gen you know, of all the organizations, because they're all the same. Uh, and you know, UNAIDS hasn't changed, despite the, this international expert panel report, they haven't changed. And they just go on, the member states just fund them, the mem and the member states are the problem too. The only problem, I think. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, they don't want the pro they don't want to deal with this issue. They just, they want, you know, we give you immunity, you deal with it yourself. Uh, and they, you know, they view many of the staff members as overpaid or highly paid, and you know, it's as if by by working for an international organization, you give up your fundamental rights. That's not the case, but that's how the member states treat this. They just don't want to deal with it, um, and it's it's a big problem. And and uh, again, I think it has to, it comes down to uh, Sandy Kyle, like New Wood, um, the staff associations, uh, they. They have to ch change that system. You know, there has to be independent investigations. There cannot be investigations done by an arm of the administration. Of course, you know, the outcome is going to be what the administration wants, not what the facts show. Um, and, and they won't do it themselves. The member states won't, won't force it. And so, you, you know, it, it has to come from within. It has to come from the syndica. It has to come from the staff associations. And it has to come from... Uh, individual staff members. I mean, un unfortunately, people pay a price um, for doing that sometimes. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Well, let me move on to the third part. Why these suppressive practices could possibly thrive? I will very quickly cover these and then move on to the last, uh, last part. In, in my view, these Three elements are the key. We have touched on many issues on the surface, but these three issues are the key. And Mr. Ferhati already covered the privilege, uh, privileges and immunities. That's one of the issues. And staff members have li very little rights. Absolutely. Look at me. In my case, I was sacked by WIPO when I was under service incurred sick leave. Yeah. My doctor issued a service incurred a sick leave. My health insurance company agreed with that. Within hours, due to WIPO administration's interference, Signal withdrew the certification. And at the end, WIPO sacked me when I was still on sick leave. You could do that, could you do that to any employee in this country? Of, no, of course not. So that's what I'm saying. We have less rights compared to many other citizens throughout the world. And ineffective check and balances on executive power, that's rather obvious. Yeah. In theory, the check and balances are in the hands of the member states. But in practice, how many member states will actually intervene on staff, individual staff issues? It's in the UN system, it's rather unfortunate, it's a lot, lot easier to achieve consensus of inaction than consensus of action. Uh, when it comes to the inv uh, these individual issues, that's not necessarily the priorities for member states uh, to fight against a consensus of full action. Uh, privileged immunities. So these things, these are the key elements lead to impunity. So. Uh, we have the king sitting on the top. The king maybe initially might be quite kind. Tried it once, twice, and then realized he or she will very soon realize, I have absolute power. And everyone will have to sing uh, emperor's new clothes. <coughs> Wonderful. So this is the reality we are facing in WIPO and in many ways throughout the organization. So what are we going to do now? We've said enough about the past, but moving forward, this is 
one of the first, this is what Mr. Flaherty already mentioned, independent investigation by external pa uh, panel of experts. We are calling an independent investigation against the WIPO's abuse of power. All five staff joined uh, individually, wrote to the governing, WIPO governing bodies already, asking to establish such a panel, just like what was done to UN AIDS and other UN organizations. To avoid continued influence and by uh, uh, inappropriate, inappropriate influence, we are also asking for the suspension of the Director General during the investigation. He was found inappropriate behavior last time. He was given a chance. Put aside all those individual cases, just look at the judgment of 4155. Even the ILO AT said he abused power. What the member states are going to do? We are also calling all the candidates of the new director of the next director general to make following commitment. The full implementation of judgment 4155. Don't fight the whole battles. Give, take another four or five years. Yeah. And also some genuine management reforms. These reforms, I don't intend to read them through, but one of the top issues is indeed the segregation of power. Today, the Director General is the one who issues the law. He is also the one who polices the law because he, his investigation function reports to him. He is the one also, he's also the prosecutor. He issues the judgment, issues the final decisions of the, of the treatment staff should receive. So in that way, he is also the judge. WIPO Appeal Board, at the end, could only make recommendations to him or her, whoever is on the top. It's still up to the boss to decide. So in many ways, uh, he or she is the boss. He, he is the judge as well. So such concentrated power could not happen in most of the countries nowadays uh, in a sovereign state with a United Nations agency like WIPO, because of its immunities and privileges, in many ways, it acts like a sovereign state. For a sovereign state to have such concentrated power is totally unaccept unacceptable. So these are the few things we would like to see going forward. Uh, if you are interested in, we can provide you with more information as well. That concludes my part of presentation. I hope you uh, you have my, I think you have my email addresses on a, at the beginning of the page. Feel free to contact me if you need more information. Thank you. I give it all back to you. Thank you. Thank you, we, thank you Mr. Flaherty. Uh, I just, you all heard, and uh, it's really surprising that a sovereign state uh, impeaches their president for abuse of power, but the director general of WIPO is not even being questioned by its member states. Like Mr. Flaherty was say, uh, mentioning, it, one of the problems of the organizations of the UN is its member states, I will add, it's the major problem of the United Nations system is the position of their member states because they are the owners of the international organizations, not the director general. So with this uh, small indication, I will come to my colleague from the uh, UN New Woods, uh, Mr. Calote, who's representing the syndica, to ask him what to do to check or to somehow limit 
the excessive power used by the heads of this organization and gave at least the staff to defend their rights. Is there anything in agenda? Do we jointly write and fight for that uh, to our bosses or our bosses will be secretary general and together with the member states? I mean, member states are first and then they can be advised through the secretary general. Do you have an agenda, a plan to do so? Uh, oui, en réalité, nous avons plusieurs plans. Naturellement, tu, as, tu, nous, tu nous as posé le, la question de 1000 millions de dollars, donc comment résoudre tous ces problèmes, parce que, eh, eh, comment s'appelle ça, c'est l'animal de vétérinaire, le cas de l'OMPI, donc où tout se passe mal. C'est aussi évident que eh, eh, ces organisations internationales sont très particulières dans le sens que eh, eh, les patrons ultimes sont les pays membres, donc, il y a aussi euh, une grande responsabilité de, de, de la part des même pays membres parce que chaque fois, euh, euh, vous faites des plaintes auprès de l'administration, auprès de M. Guterres, euh, désolé, auprès du le secrétaire général. Il va nous dire que, écoutez, mais les mains sont liées parce que sont les, euh, en fin d'histoire, ce sont les pays membres qui, qui décident. C'est-à-dire qu'en réalité, si vous voulez... Et, par exemple, des droits de travail, moi, je ne peux rien faire. Il, il faut convaincre la cinquième commission des Nations Unies pour commencer à appliquer les, les do, droits de travail. C'est-à-dire qu'en réalité, si nous voulons, par exemple, des droits de travail, nous devons pas mal de, de, de choses à faire euh, auprès des les pays membres euh, pour les convaincre d'accepter ces changements, surtout que... Le, le but de, de la plupart des pays membres est actuellement le contraire, c'est-à-dire qu'ils sont, ils sont très heureux avec une situation avec zéro droit de l'homme et zéro droit de travail au sein des Nations Unies, au sein des, des organisations internationales. Oui, justement, j'ai bien pris donc, le, cette histoire de laisser vos droits dans le vestiaire, c'est toujours le... Donc, l'histoire préférée de M. Vigne, qui ne peut pas être là, que quand vous entrez dans une organisation internationale, il y a un vestiaire. Dans le vestiaire, vous laissez vos trois et vous laissez ça pendant votre service. Et une fois le service est fini, vous, vous sortez. Et en sortant, si vous avez la chance, vous allez récupérer vos, vos trois. Donc, il y a pas mal de, de, de travail à, à faire à ce, à, à ce niveau-là. Et il faut continuer, bien sûr, le lobbying auprès des, des pays membres en ce qui concerne euh, les droits de travail et leur euh, application. Et il y a aussi l'autre vo volet, ce qui est la question de, de l'indépendance de justice, de, de l'administration de justice. Ça, je suis tout à fait d'accord que l'immunité de, de l'ancien est déjà complètement euh, corrompu, ça ne peut pas continuer. Euh, il y a euh, bien sûr plusieurs possibilités. L'une des possibilités, c'est encore que ce sont les pays membres eux-mêmes qui réalisent que dans des cas euh, sévères, par exemple dans des cas pénals, il faut lever l'immunité d'une manière automatique et non pas attendre Exactement. que que le chef, le, le secrétaire général et que, 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 que l'autre personne euh, le, le, le fasse. Donc je pense que euh, nous sommes tout à fait pour euh, une révision de, de la coopération entre la Suisse et, et les organisations internationales en ce qui concerne la bonne administration de justice. C'est une possibilité assez facile. Il y a et, par exemple à l'ONU une nouvelle directrice générale qui pourrait très bien entamer des discussions avec les autorités suisses, qui, je suis 100% sûr que seraient tout à fait ouverts à ouvrir des voies de coopération. Vous avez déjà mentionné quelques pistes, par exemple, en ce qui concerne les investigations indépendantes ou euh, euh, le jugement des cas les plus sévères. Euh, le, si, si notre secrétaire général a dit qu'il y a zéro tolérance de... D'harcèlement sexuel, c'est génial, sauf que même dans les cas de harcèlement sexuel, l'immunité n'est pas levée et le bonhomme ne peut pas aller devant les tribunaux suisses pour être, comme je vous ai dit, condamné pour ses actes. 
ce qui est complètement euh, aberrant. Il y a encore euh, une possibilité, parce que je sais par exemple qu'il y a ces dizaines de... Oh, combien Il y a maintenant plus, plusieurs candidats qui sont... Euh, euh, pour l'OMPI. Euh, il y a combien Dix. Une dizaine de candidats pour, pour euh, la direction de l'OMPI. Pourquoi euh, ne pas demander des engagements de leur part, peut-être par écrit, de euh, s'engager, euh, par exemple, euh, euh, de, sur la voie, que, comme monsieur a déjà mentionné, euh, l'application de, euh, de jugement euh, de, de tribunal de l'OMPI, mais aussi, euh, par exemple, euh, un engagement pour la levée automatique de l'immunité dans des cas euh, sévères et aussi... Euh, une, co une coopération automatique avec les, les investigateurs euh, suisses dans des cas assez graves ou dans des cas où l'indépendance de, de, euh, de l'investigation euh, est, est nécessaire. Et, et, et avec ça, je m'arrête parce que nous, avons aussi, nous devons aussi laisser un peu de temps pour... Euh, les gens qui sont venus ici pour nous poser des questions. Peut-être il y a aussi des gens qui veulent encore élaborer tous ces points. Merci de votre Merci. attention. Merci, euh, euh, Monsieur Colotte. Um, we officially close this part of our part of the briefing. Now uh, it's the questions. Uh, the floor is open for questions. And please, very brief, only questions, no comments, sir. And uh, a direct question, and not with, with any, uh, what to say, complicated things in between. The floor is open. Yes, Rodrigo. Hi. Uh, it's kind of a question and comment. <laughs> um, yeah, it's Rodrigo Garcia Conde. So I used to work in WIPO uh, for 20 years. I was fired while I was got having surgery. I was a member of the appeal board. No? Sorry. We can't accept here. To oh, sorry. Cases okay, okay. So it, it was, it's actually about the structure of, of the organization that you mentioned. It's not, it's not only, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is, is it correct that not only the director general um, has immunity in this case, for these cases, but also the vice director general? Because what I was told is that the vice director does not report necessarily to the director general. Uh, the vice director general would have uh, their own uh, area, but is it true that uh, the vice director general do not report to the director general? I mean, each, each organization is different. WIPO um, changed its rules uh, during the term of the current director general that the uh, di deputy director generals and the assistant director generals, their term must end when the term of the, of the director general ends. So they're tied directly to the um, uh, good fortune of the director general. Um, and, <laughs> and they also do, they all have functional immunity, and they all actually, they all have effectively diplomatic immunity. Any, any staff member who works in an international organization in Geneva who has the grade of P5 or above, so P5, D1, D2, Assistant Director General, direct, Deputy Director General, uh, Director General, have the equivalent of uh, diplomatic immunity in Switzerland, not just functional immunity. So it means, you know, if, if they drive drunk and kill someone, they, they can't be arrested unless the organization lifts their immunity. Whereas if you're a driver um, for an international organization and you're a G2, if, if you're driving drunk and kill someone outside of work, you can be arrested right away. If you're driving for work, you can't be until your immunity is lifted. So, but the issue, the other question is, is do they not report to the director general? Each organization is different, but it, they serve, it depends on how they are uh, nominated and appointed. I think that at WIPO, they're, they're, um, they're voted on by the COCO. And I think for them to be um, fired, they would have to be, it would be the COCO 
that would have to, to remove them. But they don't have independence in the sense that they're, you know, they can do anything they want. And I think that that's, I mean, there, there, there's some jurisprudence uh, of the ILOAT where uh, the director general of an organization was, not, I'm not talking about WIPO, a different one, was accused of uh, misconduct, physical misconduct. And of course, in order for the victim to go through the process, it ended up at, before the director general. So that didn't work. So we had asked, we'll go to the, the, the higher authority above the director general. And the tribunal said, no, 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 it can go to the deputy director general because he's appointed or she's appointed by the governing bodies. But it, it, can you imagine the deputy director general agreeing that the director general had committed misconduct, which would get him fired, or maybe wouldn't get him fired, just get him sanctioned, and then he still has to serve as the deputy of that director general. I mean, yes, in, in titularly, in nominatively, yes, they have independence, but they're really not. So um, I think in, you know, in cases Way was talking about where they wanted to get rid of you know, uh, or, or deal with the conflict of interest, if the director general is implicated in misconduct with a conflict of interest in any organization, it should go to the higher governing body, not to one of his or her deputies. I just I think it's foolish. It's it's a it's a fiction, in my my opinion. Yes, Ram. Why they're, they're delaying, I don't know. But again, I mean, each organization is created differently. Um, uh, again, I, I think it's, it's a f because it's easier to do what you want in a different organization if, you don't, if you're not answering to a central authority. I mean, you know, when in, in 10 years ago, when, when the new UN justice system was implemented, was revised, they implemented a they, they created an ethics office for the first time. And it was supposed to be the UN ethics office and it was supposed to deal with all the UN agencies and programs. But suddenly the, the, all, they didn't like that because they wanted to control their own ethics officer, which is what happens. You know, the, the executives didn't want some UN ethics office coming in and criticizing what they did. So they said, oh no, 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 we're all gonna have our own ethics officer. And Ban Ki-moon agreed to that, even though um, you know, it was not in the interest of of victims of unethical practices, you know, whether it's conflict of interest or harassment or whatever, because, they, because the member states allow it. It shouldn't be allowed, but the member states allow it because, again, they don't want to deal with these, these details. I mean, let them deal with themselves. And I, I think it's a great um, mistake, and, I, and it, it harms the efficiency of the organizations. You have, you know, you have organizations where there's great dissension among the staff, fear among the staff, um, there's no security. Uh, I just, I think it's a great mistake. But, you know, the member states allow it, even though it's all the same member states. Because, you know, some, you know, uh, for example, WIPO. I mean, it, yes, the State Department sort of deals with, what the U.S. State Department deals with WIPO um, for the most part. But then the U.S. Uh, uh, Trademark and Patent Office also is, has a say in what happens, how the U.S. government treats WIPO. I mean, so they, you know, they, they, they all grew up organically, separately, and, you know, there was the UN, and many of the initial specialized agencies simply adopted the UN rules, 
But then they started to say, oh, well, WIPO wasn't created to what, 1969 or 1970? So they said, well, we have, we'll, we'll do better rules. But uh, you know, it, it, again, it has to be the member states that change. And I don't, there's no, there's no interest because for whatever reason, I mean, it's. I don't disagree, but again, who can change it? The, it's the member states. No, but again, we are the member states. The problem is coming to be when we were. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. We just stop it here because you can write it as a proposal to Mr. Kalote because yes, the Sandika yes. will issue something, just a few lines, and he will definitely look at it. Next question, please. Yes, please. Introduce yourself. I absolutely agree, and, and, and it's also, it's not just WIPO, it, the European Patent Office, which is not a UN organization, but it is an international organization, and it subscribes to the, the jurisprudence of the ILO uh, Administrative Tribunal. Um, they also fired uh, four senior people over the past four or five years, uh, officers of their uh, SWIPO, the, the staff union of the EPO, which was different from the staff council or the staff association. Um, and two out of, three out of the four were reinstated by the ILOET, or, um, yeah, yeah, the, or had their sanctions overturned. Um, but again, it took three or four years. It took, and, and the, 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 the staff union of the EPO has a, a, a huge defense fund where they pay the salaries of fired staff members, of, of staff union members, and pay their legal fees. You know, WIPO, the staff association, never had those resources to do that. Um, maybe the WIPO circumstance might have been different had they had those resources. Because again, the international organizations, you know, they have unlimited resources essentially to hire lawyers to fight, um, and the staff associations don't. And it's it's there is there is some jurisprudence now out of the um, the UNDT, the UN Dispute Tribunal, the new. Legal internal legal system of the of the UN, which is no great shakes, but it has some uh, valuable points, shall we say? Um, one of them is that there is the, 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 several of the cases talked about how a, sta a, a, a a sitting officer of a staff association should not be able to be fired for anything. I mean, if he's arrested and convicted of a crime, that's one thing. But for anything else, while he or she is still a, a sitting officer, should not be subjected to internal administrative discipline. And I mean, that is something that, that staff could in, insist on. I mean, that's through, through Newwood or, or whatnot, but please. Oui, donc, uh, just une seule phrase, parce que nous avons déjà pris pas mal de temps de vous, et merci de votre attention, que uh, le serpent se mord sa queue, parce que bon, nous sommes de retour aux, aux questions de droit de, de travail, parce que c'est un droit essentiel l'interdiction de renvoyer les syndicalistes 
la protection des représentants du personnel, la, la représentante des de, de travailleurs, ce qui est un droit essentiel et qui est très bien établi dans plusieurs pays, y compris la Suisse. Merci. Et, euh, euh, désolé, donc une deuxième phrase. Pour moi, il est aussi évident. Euh, une, euh, on peut euh, appliquer la, la décision de, de, de tribunal de l'OIT seulement d'une seule façon, après le rétablissement des membres du, du syndicat, parce que si tout, tous les membres du syndicat, tous les leaders du syndicat ont déjà été renvoyés, bah, on va rétablir quoi Avec qui Merci. Thank you very much. I, I would like to thank you for your time and for your patience, first. Second, I would like to thank the panelists for being here and sharing uh, the, the, uh, all experiences and information they wanted. And a great thanks to the uh, Swiss Press Club, especially Mr. Roches and all his team for organizing this event. I would appreciate if you can leave behind your contact details for us for future events or all. And before leaving, there's a small reception for seen. We'd love to have you all, and if you want to discuss with panelists or among yourselves. Uh, I thank you again, and thanks for everything, and I wish you a happy new year 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Mary.